Thank you all for being with us today. I'm Teresa Clark, and I am the CEO and the chairman of Africa.com. We are thrilled to have this third year where we are revealing the definitive list of women CEOs in Africa. Among the exciting things that we'll be sharing with you today is the expansion of the list. We have about 20 more women this year than we had in previous years. And in addition to that, this year, we're focusing on the performance of the women CEOs, performance as defined by the market capitalization, looking at how the companies run by women in Africa have performed financially. And this, of course, is an important piece to expanding this list in years to come, showing the fantastic performance that women CEOs have for a variety of reasons, which we will discuss later, will all contribute to what we are all here talking about, and that is expanding the important role of women running big business in Africa. We have a fantastic lineup today, and so I will not delay. Let me start with a few thank yous, however. I want to thank, as always, Irina Stennett of Bloomberg for data that they have provided, which has been the foundation of this list. I would like to also thank Zach Johnson of Goldman Sachs, who has also been helpful in our data analysis. And of course, our sponsor for this event, Standard Bank, Kate Johns, Silga Buza. Thank you for your ongoing support and your commitment to this work, quite importantly. So with that, we are going to get going. I think that um, I will introduce our speakers later, but right now I know what everybody is here for, and that is the actual reveal of who is on the list. So let's go straight to the video and see a list of women CEOs in Africa for 2023. Welcome to the reveal of the 2023 Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. The list in its third year is unique given that it is data driven with data provided by Bloomberg. Africa.com researchers evaluated 2020 companies listed on the 24 African stock exchanges. Africa.com screened for those companies with revenue of 100 million US dollars or more, or a market cap of 150 million US dollars or more. This yielded a list of 787 companies. The list is divided into three groups. Group 1, CEOs of African Corporations, includes women who run companies listed on an African exchange that meet our revenue or market cap thresholds. Group 2, Division Heads of African Corporations, women who run divisions of listed African companies where the division itself meets our size threshold. Group 3, Regional Heads of Global Corporations, women who run the Africa region or an African country of corporations listed on global exchanges that meet a higher threshold of revenue of 10 billion US dollars or more. We start with regional heads of global corporations. At 93, Abiola Baua, CEO UBA Africa, United Bank Africa. At 92, Amiso, Regional CEO Central Africa, United Bank Africa. At 91, Puti Mahanyele Dabengwa, CEO South Africa, Naspers Limited. At 90, Abina Osie Poku, Managing Director Ghana, Absa Group Limited. At 89, Mizi Ngamelu, CEO and Managing Director Zambia, Absa Group Limited. At 88, Vivian McMenamin, CEO South Africa, Mondi PLC. At 87, Mi Twang Ambi. CEO Cameroon MTN Group Limited. At 86, Yolanda Kuba, Vice President, Southern and East Africa Region, MTN Group Limited. At 85, Nolita Fakude, Group Director, South Africa, Anglo American PLC. At 84, Edith Gia, Group Chief Executive Officer, Old Mutual Malawi Limited, Old Mutual Limited. At 83, Aida Diare, Head of Sub-Saharan Africa, Visa Inc. At 82, Paola Pochi, President Africa, Asia and Australasia Region, Imperial Brands. At 81, Kathy Prim Smith, Managing Director Africa, SAP. At 80, Louisa Ortega, 
President Africa The Coca-Cola Company at 79 Patricia Obunai CEO Ghana Vodafone Group at 78 Aminata Kane Ndiaye VP Mobile Financial Services Orange Middle East and Africa Orange Group at 77 Ireti Samuel Ogbu CEO and Country Officer for Nigeria and Ghana Citibank Citigroup Inc at 76 Brenda Mbati, President East Africa General Electric Company at 75 Yvonne Ige Managing Director Head of Sub-Saharan Africa Bank of America Cooperation at 74 Nicole Ruiz Managing Director Eastern and Southern Africa Region Nestle at 73 Lillian Barnard CEO South Africa Microsoft Corporation at 72 Dayelo Mujabilu CEO BP South Africa BP at 71 Mariam Kane Garcia Managing Director and CEO Total South Africa Total Energies at 70 Juliet Ehimwan Director West Africa Google Alphabet Inc at 69 Teju Ajani, Managing Director, Nigeria, Apple Inc. We continue with Division Heads of African Corporations. At 68, Anastasia Kimtai, Managing Director, KCB Bank, Kenya Limited. At 67, Buidumelo Masoko, General Manager, Consumer Sales, Botswana Telecom. At 66, Naniz Adal, Managing Director, Cairo Specialized Hospital, Cleopatra Hospitals Group. At 65, Pearl Ngrumah, Executive Director, Retail and Digital Banking, Access Bank Ghana. At 64, Anne Diepili, CEO, Alexander Forbes Investments, Alexander Forbes. At 63, Jackie Carr, CEO, Equipment, Fleet Management and Leasing Business, ENX Group Limited. At 62, Annette Ahern, CEO, PSG Asset Management, PSG Consult Limited at 61 Dina Samaha Group Head of Corporate Banking Societe Aribe International de Bank at 60 Yasmin Galal Head of Consumer and Business Banking Egyptian Gulf Bank at 59 Heleni Echevin CEO CKCL Limited at 58 Jacqueline Waitaka Director Corporate and Institutional Banking Division Cooperative Bank at 57 Elise Hruesbjerg Managing Director Arxo Logistics Teresa PLC at 56 Rosemary Ordu General Manager Commercial Services and Sales Kenya Power at 55 Sally Ann Jackson Managing Director Miladies Mr Price Group at 54 Kate Rycroft Managing Director Venture Business Distal Group Holdings at 53 Richelle Krutz, Regional CEO, SA Commercial, Aspen Pharmacare. At 52, Maha Al Rifai, Head of Corporate and SME's Direct Banking Division, Qatar National Bank. At 51, Nagam Kandil, Head of Retail Banking Division, Qatar National Bank. At 50, Nevin Wefki, CEO, Corporate Credit and Investment. Commercial International Bank at 49, Yoli Swapashi, CEO General Entertainment and Connected Video Multi Choice Group at 48, Fulu Badugela, CEO Multi Choice Africa Holdings Multi Choice Group at 47, Zaida Rylands, CEO Woolworths Food Woolworths Holdings at 46, Kerry Castle, CEO Mobility Solutions Motors Holdings Limited at 45 Mariam Kassin CEO Financial and Digital Services Vodacom Group at 44 Kanye Samkizi CEO Sunlam Corporate Sunlam Limited at 43 Prabashni Moodley Managing Director Old Mutual Corporate Old Mutual Limited at 42 Kerin Land Managing Director Personal Finance and Wealth Management Old Mutual Limited at 41, Aline Cote, Industrial Lead Zinc and Lead Glencore PLC. We conclude with CEOs of African Cooperations at 40, 
Faith Mabu Ndeta, Managing Director of Sichaba Breweries Holdings Limited at 39 Bronwyn Knight, CEO Grit Real Estate at 38 Magda Vieziska, Founder and Executive Chairman of Signia Limited at 37 Amelia Beati, CEO of Liberty Two Degrees at 36 Mama Taj Muati, President of SNEP at 35 Tommy Somefun, Managing Director and CEO of Unity Bank PLC at 34 Oyeyi Mike Adeboye, Managing Director of Cadbury Nigeria PLC. At 33, Jilan Sengore, Managing Director of Trust Bank Limited. At 32, Valentine Zovova, CEO of African Equity Empowerment Investments Limited. At 31, Val Nikas, CEO of Spur Core Limited. At 30, Dr. Leila Furi. Group CEO of JSE Limited. At 29, Jackie Van Niekerk, CEO Attack Limited. At 28, Mapula Mudibe, CEO of MTN Rwanda Sal PLC. At 27, Giabe Dwipe Gu Mushahana, Managing Director of Absa Bank Botswana. At 26, Dr. Heleni VC. Managing Director, Guinea's Ghana Breweries. At 25, Mansa Neti, CEO of Standard Chartered Ghana. At 24, Diane Karusisi, CEO of BK Group PLC. At 23, Lamia Tazi, CEO of Setema. At 22, Mercia Gacy's, CEO of SBN Holdings Limited. At 21, Anne Juko, CEO of Stand Big Bank Uganda. At 20, Owen Omojiafo, President and Group CEO, Transco PLC. At 19, Godri Ogbechi, Group Executive Director, Rain Oil. At 18, Catherine Lisetedi, Group CEO, Botswana Insurance Holdings Limited. At 17, Faith Mukutu, CEO, Zambief Products PLC. At 16, Mukwandi Chibesa Kunda, CEO, Zanako. At 15, Dr. Hend Al Sherbini, Group CEO, Integrated Diagnostics Holdings. At 14, Nassim Devji, Group CEO and Managing Director of Diamond Trust. At 13, Ruth Zaipuna, CEO, NMB Bank PLC. At 12, Ramasela Ganda, Group CEO, Zeda Limited. At 11, Zanele Matlala, CEO, Mirafi Resources. At 10, Neka Onyali Ikbe, Managing Director and CEO of Fidelity Bank. At 9, Ndombi Felicia Msiza, CEO, Robex Group Limited. At 8, Jane Karuku, Group Managing Director and CEO, East African Breweries. At 7, Miriam Chidiebele Olusanya, Managing Director of Guaranteed Trust Holding Company. At 6, Albertina Gegana, CEO, Royal Bafugeng Holdings. At 5, Dr. Nombasa Tsengwa, CEO, Exaro Resources. At 4, Bertina Engelbrecht, CEO, Clicks Group Limited. At number 3, Mbumi Matisa, CEO, Bidvest Group. At number 2, Nompumelelo Zigalala, CEO, Kumba Iron Ore Limited. At number 1, Natasha Falyun, CEO of Anglo American PLC. Congratulations to the Africa.com 2023 Definitive List of Women CEOs. For more information about the Africa.com Definitive List of Women CEOs, visit the Definitive List. .africa.com Wonderful. Well, congratulations to all of the 93 women on the 2023 Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. Many of you are joining us today, and I'd like to thank you because this isn't just a list that's a video or on paper or on a website, but we've been actively engaged with many of you. And I'd like to thank a few in particular who have been very helpful in our corporate training programs that we have been offering for free for women who aim to be CEOs. 
We offer this training for free to women in the first five years of their careers. And I'd like to thank Ida Diaria and Ami, Ida Diaria of Visa and Aminata Kane Ndiaye of Orange Group, who have both been very committed to sharing their expertise and knowledge with young people throughout the continent who aim to be where they are. I'd also like to give a special shout out to Amelia Biatti, who has also been particularly committed to this work and contributing to us being able to do some live events with the women from Liberty Two Degrees. You've been very generous with your corporate resources and we thank you for that. I'd also like to thank Brenda Mbata of General Electric and many other women who have participated in our legacy interviews where we are recording your stories for posterity. And we thank you for being committed to making sure that we capture that oral history and that people get to know you personally. We have about 25 women on the list who have already completed these very deep biographical interviews, and we will be sharing those interviews with you online in the months to come. So once again, congratulations to all of the women on the 2023 um, definitive list. And thank you for being with us today. I'm gonna make a brief presentation before we move on to a very exciting guest speaker that we have joining us from New York today on this very topic. But I'd like to talk to you a little bit about what we're doing differently this year. In addition to just acknowledging who these women are, we are looking at the performance of women CEOs, women who run listed companies in Africa. And I'd like to share with you a little bit more about that. So let's see if I can get this right. Oh, no, I can't. Uh, let's see, Deborah, let's see. Is that right, everybody? Can you see me now? I think we've got it right. Okay, so this is the performance analysis. So what is the definitive list of women CEOs? So this is our third year. It's data-driven. The data is provided by Bloomberg. You've heard in the video, it's listed companies only with revenue of over 100 million or a market cap of 150 million. The list, as you saw, has three groups, group heads, division heads, and regional heads. And this is how we found them. With respect to the first group, and I may not be the right person to run these slides. Deborah, if at any point you need to take over, please do so, but I'm going to keep trying my best. Um, in any case, this is the... Um, the methodology that we use. And so we started, as we said, with 2020 companies that are listed on African stock exchanges, 787 meet the threshold requirements. And the first group, the women who actually are the group heads constitute 40. We have two more groups. One group is where we have um, the division heads. And then the third group is the regional heads. But for the performance analysis, which I want to move on to, we decided to be very pure in how we are looking at these companies. For the performance analysis, we looked at the companies run by women at the very top. So that's group one only. And we looked at this historically for our data in 2022. In 2022, we had 35 women in the first group. And we took one company off because they delisted in the middle of the year. So we didn't have data for them at the beginning and the end of the year. And what we wanted to do was to see what was the value called market capitalization of companies at the beginning of the year versus the end of the year. A very simple metric, but a very important and powerful one to see, are these women creating value? If they're running these big companies, how is their performance relative to others other on African stock exchange, others throughout the world. So that's what the question is. That's what we're going to talk about and reveal here this morning. I'm really excited because we've worked incredibly hard. We have a very strong research team that has been working on this for months in order to make sure that we could bring you this important data. So what are the results? We found that the collective market cap of the companies run by African women CEOs was up 2.8% for the year that ended December 31st. Now you might say 2.8%, that's not such a big number, but it is when you compare with the alternatives. This is remarkable performance in light of the difficult economic conditions globally and especially in Africa. The fact that there was a big increase in capital costs globally with higher interest rates and many of the African currencies depreciated against the US dollars and our analysis was in dollars. And just to quote from the World Bank, in 2022, Sub-Saharan Africa's economic growth dropped from 
dropped to 3.6% from 4.1% the previous year, and it's expected to dip again in 2023. Global economic sluggishness, lingering inflation, and tough financial conditions with high debt contribute to this decline. So let's do it as all of the very serious investors do and compare it, not just looking at this in the abstract, but let's look at it compared to all of the relevant benchmarks. On this slide, we look at how this up 2.8% in the year 2022, the collective increase in market capitalization that the women on this list, the women, the top women in our group one, the women who run companies, how did they compare? Well, the Johannesburg Stock Exchange all share index was down 0.9%. So that means that the women beat the Johannesburg Stock Exchange by 370 basis points, which is basically 3.7%. Nairobi, same story, but even a stronger story. The Nairobi Securities Exchange was down 23.4%. The S&P 500, a similar measure in the U.S., down 19%. NASDAQ in the U.S., down 33%. FTSE, the share index in London, the all-share index was down 3.2%. If you'd invested in gold, it was down 0.3%. And the only thing that was actually up was the Nigeria all-share index. Had you invested in the Nigerian all-share index, you would have performed better than our collective group of women. That's the only identity, that's the only index that we've looked at that outperformed our women. So as you can see, this is a very important piece of the analysis to look at performance and to see that investing in women is not only doing the right thing, but it is actually driving value. Let's take a look at who these women are to understand it a little bit more. We had in 2022, 34 women CEOs who came from 12 countries across Africa. The country that was most represented, as you could see, was South Africa, and secondly, Nigeria and Kenya. Another important thing to consider is the industries in which our women work. And quite interestingly, financial services dominates women in our, in our women CEO list. Financial services dominates something like nine to one for every one woman in another industry, we have nine women in financial services. This is a very interesting piece of data. I'm not quite sure what we do with it or where we go with it from here, but I think that it's very interesting to note, as you probably noted when we went through the entire list, that we have such a large percentage of women running companies in the financial services sectors, a handful across the others, power, telecoms, pharmaceuticals, property, mining, food and beverages, consumer goods, power, and some conglomerates. But financial services is definitely outsized. A few additional observations and comments. Women CEOs, as we said, um, did well in the financial services, but again, the financial services sector itself did very well in Africa in 2022 due to the increased interest rates. So that increased the revenue. So they were part of a rising tide that lifted all boats, one might argue. The largest gain that we had from 2022 came from a Nigerian bank where that CEO led her company to have an increase in the value of the company, the market capitalization of 57% between January 1st and December 31st of 2022, a whopping 57% increase, which is quite significant. The top four performers on the list were also in financial services, all with gains in excess of 40%. The fifth highest performer on the list was in the food and beverage sector and delivered a double digit growth in excess of 30%. So hopefully this will share with you a little bit about how our women are performing. And we look forward to continuing to evaluate this on an annual basis. And with that, I am thrilled to introduce our keynote speaker for today, or person I'm going to introduce an interview, um, Patricia Lizarraga. Patricia is joining us right now from New York City, very committed to being with us at another investment conference, and she has stepped away and is joining us from the lobby of that conference live right now in New York City, where she will be speaking in just a bit. But she's come to be here with us because she is the founder of Hypatia Capital. She is the managing partner and this company is the founder of the Hypatia Women's CEO Index and the Hypatia um, Women's ETF. Women's CEO ETF. Let me make sure that I say it properly. 
Um, Patricia has a long background, over 25 years of merchant banking experience, and has been committed throughout her career to women's empowerment. And we really wanted to have her with us because she just launched her ETF fund in January of 2023, which basically is an investment fund that invests in women CEOs across the U.S. How relevant to what we are doing in Africa. She also created a women CEO index looking at the performance of women CEOs of public companies in the United States. So her work precedes us. And we are very thrilled that she has come to share her background and experience with us. Thank you so much for joining us today, Patricia, live from New York. Thank you, Teresa. Uh, so great to be here. And just a little caveat, I'm actually in Chicago at the oh. uh, Investment News Women Financial Advisors Conference. I am usually in New York. Hypatia is in New York, but this is, you know, this is amazing. There's 250 women financial advisors in the room next to me. And they're all, I think they would all be fascinated to hear what I hear what you're doing as they walk by and they saw the screens and all the names coming by. Um, everybody was asking me about it. So if I turn around, it's so that nobody trips on the wires. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you, Patricia, for your commitment to joining us from Chicago. And I, I apologize for that. I am correct in Chicago, not New York. Um, Patricia, let's tell us a little bit about why you created the Women CEO Index in the United States. Sure. So um, I am a believer. I started Hypatia about 15 years ago. I was an investment banker, so uh, M&A, uh, mergers and acquisitions, and my clients were CEOs and CFOs. And once in a while, I would get a female client, and she would always be so well-rounded, so amazingly smart, efficient. Uh, great performance, but also wonderful person, people liked, strong, et cetera, that I said, you know what, I want more clients like this. And I set out to, first, to start my own firm. But I also since then had the hunch that women outperformed. And so over the years, and it's taken, you know, it's taken all of the 17 years to really finally get this product off the ground, which is a WCEO ETF. It trades on the New York Stock Exchange. And it invests in all American companies that are public, that have a market capitalization of 500 million, that have a female CEO. We invest the day the woman becomes CEO and we sell the stock once they stop. And, and why? Because we believe that women outperform. Why do we believe that women outperform? We believe that women outperform because it's just harder for women to get to the top. They're only 5% of CEOs. So the ones that do, by definition, have something extra. And the question is, can you isolate that extra factor? And this, Teresa, goes to the point you were making that a lot of your CEOs are either, you know, in one sector, one country, et cetera. And, and, and I think that's something that, that we struggled with a lot in the United States. For example, the large number of CEOs that we have in the consumer discretionary and healthcare sector. So how could we make a uh, uh, index and investment vehicle that wasn't a consumer healthcare. It wasn't about consumer healthcare. It was actually about women, right? Because we believe women outperform. We want to invest in women and we want to make sure that we are isolating the female factor. So, um, you know, it's taken us 15 years to get here, but here we are. And I'm not sure if I directly answered the question, but oh, you I'm answered so my excited question, about what And I you answer your own questions. You're wonderful interviewing yourself. So. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just get so, you know, I, oh, I, yeah, I no, love this what is you're good. doing so much. And I love the room, you know, the scene, 250 women behind me. And I think that together we can all really start changing the world to reflect the one we want to live in. So Patricia, talk a little bit more about what you call the female factor. Sure. So again, what we're trying to do is isolate just the performance that's about women so that you can invest in that female performance that we believe outperforms the average. So in order to do that, we had to take our data set and say, what else could be influencing this? And for example, we didn't want it to be size, right? So as you probably are well aware, the S&P 500 is a market capitalization weighted index. So the top five stocks, which tend to be Alphabet, Apple, um, Google, et cetera, really make up the bulk, right? The biggest part of that index or, or a big part of the index, which influences performance is about those stocks more than about all 500 stocks. So what we decided to do is equally weighted. 
Therefore, our largest stock, which is usually Accenture, has exact same weight by industry as our smallest stock in that sector, which could be, you know, you know, just very, very much smaller. It could be 500 million to market cap rather than 200 billion ish. So, so, so that made it about not size. And then the second thing we did was make it about not industry, right? So we took our benchmark and we benchmark to the small cap stock index because it's equally weighted. So we took our benchmark, which is the Wilshire small cap stock index, and it said, okay, in energy, we have 6%, in consumer discretion, we have 20%, I'm making up the numbers, et cetera, et cetera. So we made sure that we had the same industry percentage. So for example, to make this easy to understand, if we had 100 stocks, and we actually have 120, if we had 100 stocks, say each one would have 1%, but energy is supposed to have 6%. But we only have three companies in the United States that are energy stocks led by women. So in order to make it equally weighted, we gave those three energy stocks a 2x multiplier. So what happens when you do that is you take away the sector influence. So you're not investing in the sector, you're investing in the women. And by doing that, we made what's called the tracking error, like how far away is it from exactly matching an index the tracking error is all about stocks picking. And the only thing these stocks have in common is that they have female CEOs. Fantastic. Thank you for that explanation, Patricia. And let me ask you one last question. Mm -hmm. While you are not an Africa expert, do you have reason to think that the concept that you're doing is limited to the US? Do you think we can also apply this concept in Africa? We absolutely think it is applicable to Africa. We think it's applicable to the world because we think that in the whole world, there are still institutional barriers to make um, to, to, to women advancing. And until we take away those barriers, and my understanding is that they're very, very strong in Africa, then the people that make it to the top by definition are extraordinary. So I believe that this same outperformance would be found in a similarly constructed index in Africa. And where do you see investing through a gender lens heading in the years to come, Patricia? Well, I think it's exploding because the fact of the matter is uh, there is a generational change and the data is telling us that younger people really care about where they put their money. And there's also a, um, at least in the United States, a transfer of wealth to women over the next decade due to longevity factors. So we believe that women, that the research tells us, right, that women and younger people really care about what happens with their investments and women care about women. The question is, how do we give them product that actually delivers what they're wishing to invest in? And if you think about it, even, even in Africa, right, your stock portfolio is going to have some kind of global weighting, right? It, it doesn't matter where you live. The U.S. is the biggest economy in the world. You've got some China. You have to decide if you want to invest in that or not. Then you have some Western Europe, and then you have emerging markets. So all over the world, it's important to show in each of these geographies where you should be invested for diversification. Diversification is the free lunch in, in investing. You know, how you add diversification to your portfolio by adding women to your portfolio and you add the performance of the factor that we believe in. So we think it's going to boom. And uh, we are glad that we're talking to you guys to, to, to all watch it together and be part of it. Well, Patricia, I really want to thank you for your support for our work. You stand ahead of us. We, we look to follow in your footsteps. And we thank you for taking the time and making the effort from that important conference where you're about to speak in Chicago to be with us. It's quite an effort that you've made to make sure you support this in Africa. And we thank you for doing that. What you guys are doing is amazing. I, I was inspired before I heard the speak and I want a copy of the video, but now I'm super inspired and I'm going to be talking about it probably instead of WCO all afternoon. And um, and just, you know, for those of you who are looking to invest in women, look for these pro look, these products are starting to exist. They exist, you know, on, in privates. I think I know that there are some some investment opportunities in Africa and in the U.S. It's the WCO ETF. So put your U.S. investment there. <laughs> a little plug for us. But congratulations, Teresa. What you're doing is amazing. And I look forward to continued collaboration. Well, we wish you continued success with the work that you do with women CEOs in the U.S., and we hope to be able to collaborate with you. Thank you very much, Patricia. Thank you.
Talk to you soon. That was Patricia Lizarraga, who's the managing partner of Hypatia Capital, the head of the Women CEO Index and the Women CEO ETF in the United States, joining us live from Chicago. Thank you again. All right, so we are going to move on to another woman powerhouse. We're bringing it back to Africa. We're going to talk now with Vera Songwe. Uh, Vera is in many ways a household name. People don't need much of an introduction to Vera. Um, and I'm going to let the video roll because we have pre-recorded our interview with, with Vera. And so Deborah, let's go straight over to Vera. We're very happy to be able to have this session with Dr. Songwei, who's not able to join us today as we reveal the 2023 list of women CEOs. So a few days beforehand, we were able to sit down with her before she jetted off and to get her to contribute to this conversation with her thoughts about women's in particular performance as business women relative to male counterparts. Now, Dr. Songwei, as everybody knows, is had a long and illustrious career with the World Bank. For five years, she was the head of the UN Economic Commission for Africa. Today, she is a fellow at the Brookings Institute and is also the chair of the Liquidity and Sustainability Facility, which is playing an important role in helping to create a bigger market for African sovereign debt. Um, another thing of the many, many accomplishments that Dr. Songwei had while she served as the head of the UN Economic Commission for Africa was that she was the driving force behind the African Women's Invest Impact Fund. And this fund has been established in partnership with Standard Bank and Visa and a number of global partners in order to provide more capital for women fund managers in Africa. Dr. Songwe looked at the asset management industry and saw that women who run private equity and venture capital funds were not getting as much capital as their male counterparts. And she put together a, power, a powerhouse community of players to address that issue. So she is part of our tribe of people looking to make a difference for women business leaders. Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today, Vera. Thank you, Theresa. Good to see you again, and congratulations um, to all the women that we're honoring today, the CEO, uh, women leaders. Well, thank you so much. So wh why don't I start by asking you, uh, when you were at the UN, you know, what drove you to create the African Women's Impact Fund? I think it was very simple. It was just when you looked around you and you looked at sort of the lack of diversity among fund managers, uh, uh, you could see that it was not just a pipeline problem, but that there were just systemic barriers uh, uh, to, to, to sort of women getting into the business, you know, from uh, today uh, across the globe, when we talk about equal pay and we talk about equal access and we talk about childcare issues, these are not uh, things that sort of impact only women who are in the sort of standard bureaucratic jobs, it also impacts this industry as well. And you could just see the difficulties for women to raise capital, get out of school, go and try to raise capital, get a job, raise a family. And it, the barriers were enormous. And I, so, so I, we thought, you know, why don't we do something directly for women fund managers? So that was the first one was to see if we were going to do it, we could understand, you know, what was the life cycle of getting from point A to point B, understand where the barriers were the most stiff, and then see how you could unpack that. And then the second one was really to say, you looked around and, you know, uh, women-led businesses receive only 7% of uh, private equity and venture capital in many of the emerging markets. But part of it is because we don't have uh, women-led uh, funds. And so we thought if we can put more women on the other side or, of the table, we will be able to get a lot more and maybe diversify uh, the offers, because even when we have a lot of women uh, of fund, uh, fund managers or funds who are willing to, to, to support women, you know, there is a small circle, you know, you have to be microfinance or you have to be uh, some small and medium. And was, there was, there was not anybody out there thinking big for women. And I thought if we can give more, put more resources in the hands of women, make them determinants of the careers of other women and on of their own careers themselves, then we will actually be able to sort of take the idea to a much larger scale, have more women thinking big and make the, 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 the ecosystem a lot more diverse. Well, that's very big thinking. And you know, it, it's very 
strategic to think about how those big flows of capital don't go to women, but if you change the decision makers who has those big flows of capital, they are more likely to invest in women businesses. So that, that's, that's a very, very important and strategic move that you've made in uh, with partnership with others. I know it wasn't just you, but very, very good um, leadership in, in you know, driving that to happen. Well, when we think about women as fund managers and making investments in the specific space that you've been operating in has been private equity and venture capital for this fund that you were behind, how do women compare to their male counterparts as investors? I mean, I think we've seen uh, that, and this work we did almost 20 years ago at the World Bank, dating ourselves, but uh, with Ngozi Okonjiwela, when we started the whole gender conversation, just why should we bother to look at women? And we looked at it and saw that women were good economics because it said that when you invest in women, women had a much higher return. And at the time we were just looking at women SME businesses. But when you look at this uh, 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 a space today when we begin to look at sort of women in 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 the capital markets you know first of all less than 1.3 percent of the 69 trillion global financial assets today are under management by women let alone by women of color uh, uh but of that 1.3 that is on the management by those women those women actually deliver a higher x than the men on average so clearly women's performance is much stronger even in that segment right when we did the studies 20 years ago we were looking at women in agribusiness we were looking at women traders and there we saw that first of all they had a higher return they paid uh, uh their principles and service their debt much faster and and we're able to borrow and go go into bigger businesses faster we're seeing exactly the same thing uh when we look at the private equity and venture capital spaces and uh women fund managers so so again I think what we're beginning to see and it, and it's not to say we want both men and women by the way to do well because when we invest our capital we always expect a good return and 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 we think that diversity is good in this market but I, I think when you look at 1.3 uh, percent of 69 trillion uh, on the management by women we know that there is a problem we need a lot more and we believe that if we can do that uh, uh, the results will be much better for everybody. That's great. So as we think about women who are CEOs of operating companies, do you think that all of the same topics apply, that the same principles apply? Um, you've been focused on women who are fund managers um, at a very macro level. Is there anything that you think is, is different or that we should be thinking about when we look at these women who actually run companies as opposed to funds? I, I think the same things, and I think one of our partners, I mean, when we started this at the ECA uh, a while back, you know, there was a lot of tension about whether we keep it inside the ECA or whether we we, we open it up. And at the time, uh, I made a decision that because we wanted it as an African uh, impact fund, really not to be a sort of donor driven impact fund, but really to start being tested by the markets. Uh, we were very happy when uh, Standard Bank decided to become uh, our core Sort of private sector partner of course uh, standard bank is is the best on the continent uh, uh in this business but later on we got Midas associates uh and then we got riskura so we now have a very solid and we, you know u.s pension funds are looking at at AWIF, and so this is a call for anybody who is interested in investing in AWIF. but what we found out is that yes uh, uh, the women needed capital, but more than uh, uh, capital, they also needed networks. You know, the men are very used to and very, it's very easy for them to find their networks. And if they had stresses to talk about it and, and discuss, you know, emerging trends and then see how each one of them was addressing it. And these networks for women were not obvious. And of course, it's, you know, by the end of the day, you're rushing to pick up the kid, you're rushing to take the grandma to, to, to the hospital or something. And so we don't sort of necessarily always have the time to be able to find those social networks for mentoring, but also the professional networks for mentoring. And I think this is one of the things that Riskura, that is one of our partners, is bringing to us, is also that in addition to providing capital, they are able to provide that kind of mentorship support system network that allows you to sort of discuss trends in the market, discuss ideas, discuss emerging new products, and then see, you know, as you yourself are growing up as a woman entrepreneur in, in the 
business, how can you do it? Uh, today uh, on the continent, we know that fast moving sort of uh, consumer goods are a big share of the business, but also it's the service industry. And we see many more women getting into those segments of the market, but there are also segments of the market that can come and go quite quickly. And so being able to work with women to see how they can diversify, get into new markets, particularly for us on the continent, uh, because our markets, if you're not in Nigeria, Angola, or South Africa, our markets are quite small. And so to be sustainable, you need to almost, you know, continuously grow uh, uh, your, your, your consumer base. And so these kinds of efforts need also, you know, policy understandings in the different geographies you want to get into. And this is some of the support that uh, we find that the women CEOs uh, can benefit from because they have a network that supports them. Well, as always, Vera, it's a pleasure to have you join us. Thank you for continuing on this journey with us as we look at women's leadership in the private sector across the continent. We hope that you'll come back again as you've been with us before, but it's wonderful to see you progress and we thank you for your support. Thank you and keep doing this. We need to keep the conversation, I think, uh, uh, alive and also continue to show with all the data uh, that you have. I think the, the most powerful thing in this business is data, right? And data talks more than anything. If we can demonstrate that uh, through data that women are doing well and doing better in some cases, uh, hopefully that we can crowd in a, few, uh, a lot more capital um, um, to them. So yes. well, thank you again. Congratulations. Congratulations uh, to the women CEOs. And I hope someday we will have a chance to meet. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vera. Well, fantastic. So we're going to move on to our next speaker. And our last speaker for today is Owen Omogiafo, the president and group CEO of Transnational Corporation known as Transcorp PLC in Nigeria. Um, I've had the privilege of knowing Owen for many, many years since when she was the chief operating officer at the Tony Alumilu Foundation, where she made big impact and has just continued to rise through the ladder since that time to her current role as the group CEO of Transcorp. Now, many people who travel in Nigeria know the Transcorp Hilton in Abuja. It is the place to stay if you are on business in Abuja. But beyond hospitality, Transcorp also is a very important player in diversified investments across Nigeria in power and energy. Owen is the first female to hold the position as the group's CEO of Transcorp. And we've invited Owen today because as we focus on performance, Owen is one of the top performing women CEOs on our list. And so we are thrilled to be able to have you here and talk with us today. Owen, let's take you off of mute and let me welcome you properly. Hello, Owen. Hello, Theresa. Thank you so much for the invitation and for the list. Thank you for the recognition. And we know you are also traveling and have made a big effort to be with us. And I thank you for doing that and bending over backwards today, Owen. Thank you. It couldn't be otherwise. I just had to even though I'm existing on 30 minutes of sleep right now. <laughs> and where, where do we find you today? London. In London, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you for making the effort. Thank so, you. Oh, let's start by talking a little bit about, um, tell us just a little bit about your rise to the top of Transcorp. Tell us a little bit more about your history. I've shared some of it, but I think people would like to hear it from your, from your mouth. Okay, thanks, Teresa, and thanks everyone on the call. It's been an interesting journey. Uh, in addition to being the first female CEO, I am also the youngest ever to have held this role and also enjoy the, the privilege of being the youngest CEO on the Nigerian exchange, uh, which is quite uh, an interesting one. And if you're familiar with our environment, uh, female and young, nah, it's not really what tends to happen, but uh, this is the journey. I've had quite an interesting career with a background, first degree in sociology and anthropology and a master's in human resource management and a few other professional qualifications along the way. I'm very passionate about people development and African development, it's not optional. I worked at Accenture in the past and I joined, I've worked with Mr. Tony Lumelu for about 15 years now and have had a good career working with him. He's a very strong he for she and our group is one of the most celebrated when it comes to 
women holding critical roles and not token appointments. So some uh, positions I've held working within my group has been the director of resources at Ayers Holdings, where I was the pioneer human resource director and what part of those that set up the Tony Lumelu Foundation as well, a foundation that we are all so proud of. I still remember having tea with Teresa at the Four Seasons all those years ago when we were speaking with you back then about being a part of the advisory board. And I say thank you, Teresa, for believing when we're just starting that you saw what was going to happen. And I hope you're proud of what you're seeing, uh, of what you're seeing today. And it should interest you to note that as of the last um, entrepreneurs list, 70% of the people that made that list were women coming from the 15% we started out with. So from being the chief operating officer of the foundation, I went on to become the executive director of corporate services of Transcor PLC. Teresa has given a fabulous description to Transcor. Uh, what I would like you to remember is that our purpose is to improve lives and transform Africa. That's our purpose, that's why we get out of bed daily. From being the um, executive director of corporate services, I became the CEO of Transcor Hotels PLC. And from there, after doing that job for 15 months, the board said, you know what? You can run the group. And today, here I am as the group CEO of Transcor. Fantastic. Well, that's a wonderful story and you certainly tell it better than I do. So tell us, Owen, why do you think that women CEOs outperform male counterparts in terms of driving share price? And that's a very interesting question, Teresa. I'm going to expand it a bit and say beyond driving share price, I would say we drive is driving value, right? Because there are a number of things that influence how your share price would move. And one of those critical things is the trust that people have in your company, right? A perception of your company and your ability to consistently deliver how they look at your, your corporate governance. I think it was Patricia, the earlier speaker, she talked about how it is for women. We have to work harder than our male counterparts. And this is the reality. You step in, you're working harder, you know that there's a lot riding on your shoulders. And whilst you have people who are rooting for you to succeed, you also have people who are waiting for you not to succeed so they can confirm that a woman could not do it. So for that reason, we're very deliberate. We are very driven. We're very driven to succeed. And we think beyond just the numbers. You know, by nature, whether it's by nature, by how we're socialized, how we're groomed, we are brought up to be nurturers. So as we are looking at the numbers, as we are managing the business, we look at the underbelly, we look at the soft sides as well. One thing I would like you to take a look at in your, in your research, by the way, is how employee engagement levels are in the companies that women run. Mm -hmm. So my background is in HR, and there's a direct correlation between employee engagement, employee happiness, and business results. If your people are happy, you see the result. Your people are not happy, you will also see the result, be it negative, be it positive. And I strongly believe that the way women lead, the way we lead, the way we've been socialized to lead, especially within the African context, within Nigeria, I mean, I can't talk about for the other countries, but where you still have a country where a woman is still seen quite predominantly as the homemaker, yeah? the homemaker, the nurturer, that same training that you have, it comes out and you say, hey, you give me this one share, I'm going to grow it. You give me this one plot of land, I'm going to grow it. I will take that land and I will make an estate. That estate will become an empire. And as I'm building that empire, I'm building people along. I'm working with the communities I operate within very well. My stakeholders, be it my regulators, my shareholders, my employees, my board, we are all working towards this. And we are also not very, it's not about, for my, in my experience, for women, it's not about me, me, me. You always hear there's a lot of us in the room when you hear, when, you, when you're in a room where a woman is leading. It's more about us and less about me. And I think that with this mixed match that we have here, that brings the, the, the resultant effect of the share price increase that we see. Share price is an outcome of a number of other things. Wow, what a response, Owen. It's quite clear, I imagine, not only to me, but to everybody, why you are one of the top performing women CEOs on the continent of Africa. Great response. Thank you, Teresa. 
You know, do you think and there hasn't been data put out there previously about the performance of women? And um, as you say, you are the youngest woman, the youngest person uh, to lead a company on the Nigerian Stock Exchange, first woman in your company. And I think you said the only woman um, on the NGX. Is that true? No, that's not true. There no, no, there are some other women. Yeah, yeah. No, 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 no. The first lady, in first woman to lead both Transco Hotels and then Transco PLC. Okay. So the question is, do you think that investors in Nigeria have a sense that women outperform their peers? I, I don't think so. Reason? There's no data, like you said. And that's why the work you're doing is very good. It's highly commendable. And I like that it's um, this year there's a twist to it beyond what we did last year, where we've gone on to look at the numbers. <laughs> at more detail to say, okay, year on year, how has, uh, what's the growth? Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. the numbers work. Once you're in the boardroom, you need to talk numbers and numbers make people sit up. So no, I don't think, I don't think it's, in, it's not a Nigeria thing, it's not an Africa thing. There's not enough data. There are not enough studies that have been focused on to see the link between having female leadership and the results. Yes, we have data on diversity but diversity is broader than gender. Mm -hmm. So we need to isolate the catalytic factor of gender in results, in growth and in sustainability. Just like Patricia was talking about the female factor, isolate the female factor so we can understand analytically what that does. How are women represented on your management team, Owen? Oh, it's, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> so my my direct uh, so Transco you we we've got I have four subsidiary CEOs yeah four subsidiary so I call ourselves the quintuplet of five so we've got two female three male uh, across our group and I, I'm quite proud of this figure we right now we have a two to one ratio for men across the entire Transco group if you keep in mind that Transco is in power oil and gas and hospitality. Power and oil and gas, these are predominantly male driven. So notwithstanding this, we still have 33% of our total workforce being women. It's not, it's not, a, it's not the numbers you see typically. And my power businesses are in some, then a bit remote location is not where you will find women going to naturally. But we are working, one of the things we're doing now is a backward integration as we are calling it. We're going down to the universities to start get, catching them young. So they do their uh, industrial apartments and our plants. So they're already exposed from when they are much younger and they're looking forward to working. But coming up in my management level, we are 50-50. 50-50, wow. yes. And well, no gunshots, <laughs> no upset. <laughs> my executive management team, my executive office uh, is 100% female. That's, That's what I have. That's what I have right now. Uh, but I also have some fantastic men that work with us and we all bring our various perspectives to the table. Well, that's fantastic. Well, just to make sure that we continue to use the numbers, I wanna make sure everybody knows what your numbers are according to our calculations. And okay. that is that in the year 2022, um, we calculate that you drove the market capitalization of Transcorp up by 8.3%. So that's looking at what the market cap was at the beginning of the year. You grow it 8.3% in a very difficult environment as we identified previously. And that compares to 2.8% for the women overall. So you are an outperformer. Um, in your own league compared to women, compared to men, compared to your industry, compared to your peers everywhere. You're a real superstar. And we've known that before, but as you said, it's nice to put numbers to attach to that. Thank you very much, Teresa. I love those numbers. <laughs> well, fantastic. Oh, and I can't thank you enough for making the effort to be with us from London. Um, we congratulate you on for being on our list, one of the smallest of your accomplishments, but certainly being one of the top financial performers, we hope to showcase your good work and we wish you continued success. I know that you are driving value today in 2023 for your company and you will continue to do so for the years to come. 
Thank you. Thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you, Owen. Well, with that, what a wonderful way to end this session. We're going to end promptly the hour now. You've asked a few questions. I want to make sure I get back to you on. Some people have been asking, how do you get um, access to the corporate training that we mentioned? If you're on this list or if you registered for this, you will receive automatically an invitation to the next time that we do the free training for women who aim to be CEOs. Um, again, I'd like to congratulate all of the women, the 93 women on the Africa.com definitive list of women CEOs. I'd like to thank all of our speakers today, Patricia Lizaraga, Vera Songwe, and Owen Omodiafo. And in particular, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Standard Bank, who is very committed to this work and to advancing women in the business place. Thank you very much. And we look forward to seeing you at the next event. Bye-bye.